American car culture has found its way all around the world. It's a national treasure that has gone global and soaked deep into just about every aspect of modern life. And most people don't even know it. I'm Dan Stoner, and I've spent my life searching for the legends of underground car culture hidden in plain sight and telling their stories that nobody else can. Some you might be familiar with, some you might not. These are the stories you've heard of, but have never actually heard. This is the Motor Underground. Thirty years ago, an underground revolution in hot rodding sparked on the West Coast. In the early 90s, the baby boomers had already ruined hot rods for anyone under the age of 50. Now they were called street rods and they had air conditioning and seat belts and seat heaters. They even had sunroofs. The original concept of a hot rod as counterculture was long, long gone. But then something happened. Kids with a whole lot more time than money found old cars and early speed parts and useless motors flooding the swap meets in Northern and Southern California. The boomer street rodders were cleaning out their garages to make room for the cars they had paid good money to have built for them. And these kids were scooping it all up for cheap and they started building a hot rod revival out of it all. And this, this is their story. Hey, now this is your bearded buddy, Billy F. Gibbons, and uh, we're talking about hot rod revivalism. Yes, the question remains, what is it about hot rods and rock and roll that go so sweetly together? Nobody seems to know quite uh, how to how to table it? I think it would be fair to say that uh, things that go fast and loud uh, certainly fit both hot rod and rock and roll like a glove. What am I going to say? I have nothing to say. This is this does all the talking right here. This thing. It may not appeal to everybody. And they may not understand it or, or feel that it's appropriate for, for me, totally. Bobby Green, you know Bobby Green? There's a guy that lives, breathes, and, and expresses that lifestyle. You know, we're coming out of the car scene of the 80s into the early 90s, where all the cars are overly painted, overly restored. They look like pieces of candy rolling around on white walls. It had gotten so far that the custom scene had kind of almost eaten itself. You know, starting in the 60s with Big Daddy Roth and the outrageousness, and then moving into this really smoothed over, you know, version of itself by the 80s, and the heartbeat paint jobs, I mean, you name it. It, it had gone so far away from where it started. And the shifters came along, we're, we're gonna take it back to ground zero, just straight off ground zero. If, you know, and show you guys where you've gotten it wrong. And then suddenly, you've got this group of guys that look like they literally walked out of a movie. You know what I mean? They walked out of American Graffiti. Um, or Grease. I mean, they were like, everything about them was, was, was all the way. They were, they were actual greasers, right? They weren't just car guys at Bob's Big Boy. They were a gang of greasers. They were frowned upon. You know, you'd go to a show, they would go to a show and show up in their cars, which to me, I mean, they, they fascinated me. They were rattle traps to, to the, the street rider. And some of those cars did not look safe at all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at least these guys were exercising their passion and building something to enjoy and have fun with and share with everybody. Outside of just being car guys, they were a greaser club. And, um, and they lived up to it. They really did. I mean, they were always the drunkest. They were always the loudest. They were always the funniest. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it, it was great. It was, it was fun to be around them. 
I would always go to Linda's Doll Hut and there was always some kind of uh, commotion that would take place. You know, you're watching a band and, and uh, someone's doing burnouts in the street and the smoke's blowing into the bar and the band's trying to play, you know? I mean, it's always something like that. And then when I, you know, I saw the, sh I heard about the shifters through magazines, you know, because there was really no internet. I mean, we still read magazines. When I saw these guys, I saw 19-year-old guys, 20-year-old guys, who liked the same music that I did, driving cars, right, that didn't have to be owned by a dude that had uh, a six-figure bank account, right? My dad was not into old cars, um, but he was into old music. My parents were very much, uh, you know, they grew up in the 50s and 60s, early 60s. They weren't about the Beatles and all that. They were more Elvis and surf music and, you know, the early stuff, Buddy Holly and all that. And so, you know, I, I had a lot of that always playing um, at my house when I was a kid. And I think a lot of us had the same experience. So I started high school in 1982, my freshman year. That was the year, in my opinion, or, or, or for me, that everything really changed. We just had an era of, of Ted Nugent and Kiss and everything. And in Southern California, the radio station K-Rock was really big. And you had the new wave. The new wave kind of crosses over to the mod stuff and the ska stuff and the rockabilly stuff. And I... I got into be, primarily because of my cousin James Enfelt, the Blasters, Los Lobos, uh, Rosie Flores, and of course the Stray Cats. I got, you know, neck deep into rockabilly and have been into it ever since. So it's been 40 years that I've been living this way. Dad was pretty much a big influence to me. I mean, I mean like, when I was a little kid, he'd be, you know, he'd drive me around, he's playing on like, K-Earth, one of the oldies station. And I liked the music, you know, I just loved it. And I got hooked on it, you know, and it just never changed. You put grease in your hair and roll up your shirt and put a pe pack of you know gum in your sleeve and then roll around and think you're cool and it just progressed from there and then you know you uh, start to do that and you find people with mutual likes and then the, the car thing it, I bought my first car when I was 12 so you know it was just it's been ingrained in me it didn't it wasn't something I did because I wanted to be cool because it definitely was not accepted at Tustin High School it was just something that I it was inside me and I'm not trying to be all like dramatic about it, but it's truly, I, it was something in my soul that it's just something that's always been there and it will always be with me. Of course there's the graffiti coupe, of course there's the California Kid 34 that Martin Sheen drove in California Kid, but the one quintessential car for the record that we all looked at and admired and just drooled over was Brian Setzer's Model A. In 1983, the Stray Cats came out with their second album, Rant and Rave, and on the cover of that album shows the Stray Cats pretending like they're still in a old Fiesta hubcap and he's got the Rod Snapper's jacket on and there's this East Coast style, but it was still badass, unchopped Model A coupe, fenderless, big and little white walls, old Fiesta caps, a small block Chevy with three twos. Uh, Jeff Vaughn in, in the Shifters and I especially, we just, we aspired to have something like that. We didn't know how at the time, but we were gonna get one of those type of cars. That's where it all started. We met Alex at uh, the, uh, what the hell was that? The, uh, God damn it, I can't even think I'm drunk. <laughs> at the Palomino Club. We met Alex at the Palomino Club. We met at Rockabilly shows and we had that mutual interest. We, we had these cars like 55 Chevys and 53 Buicks. I had a 36 Ford pickup at the time. And we were all starting these, these projects. I've got a body, really he's got a deuce frame. and. His cousin, James Enfeld, was playing that night. And me and Anthony were there, and we saw James Enfeld. It was a great night. We made good friends with Alex. About two months later, Anthony and I were driving down Beach Boulevard in Anaheim, and Alex happened to be driving another car, and he kept pulling up next to us, and, you know, like, who the fuck is this guy? And Finally, Anthony looked out the window and said, hey, that's that James Enfield's cousin guy, you know, remember? It's like, oh yeah. So they ended up like reaching hands outside the car and like shaking hands and, and uh, Alex 
followed us back to our shop. Anthony and I had, and I had a little shop, you know, in Stanton. And uh, we went over there and just partied for like a couple hours. And then after that, it was just on. You know, we were hanging out with Alex all the time and Jeff and Marky. We went out to Alex's house. Marky's out there working on something and he's got this big old pompadour. And I remember like laughing, go, look at even his brother's got a pompadour, you know? It was totally cool. We just hit it off right off the bat, man. We were just good friends. The club really formed, so there's, the shifters, there's half of us originated in Riverside, the other half originated in Orange County. We met at Rockabilly shows. The commonality was just so freaking uncanny that we knew not only are we going to have badass hot rods, we're going to have a hot rod club. One day, my brother and I were going to visit Kevin Sledge in Orange County to hang out with him and drink some beers. He still lived at home then. Talking about a future car club name, when we first started getting, you know, into it, it was all about like Rat Fink and having tall shifters and stuff like that. And that's how it kind of came up with like having a, you know, shifters. And it's like, that's club, that's club name, shifters. Yeah. Done. We went to Sinus Kevin's house and he's like, shifters, that's so badass. Why didn't I think of that? The rest is history. The car club coat is a traditional thing. You know, it's what the Hot Rodders did in the 50s. And we wanted to emulate the cool generation of hot rodders, which were the guys in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And because of Lion's drag strip and all these Southern California drag strips, nine times out of 10, the drag strip jackets were red. I said, our jackets have to be red. And we already had the font that design. I had the jackets made. A lady here in Riverside was one of two people, embroiderers back then, that had the old machines to do loop stitching. I found her just on a whim and looking in the in the yellow pages. She goes, oh yeah, we call that chain stitching loop. I said, can you do our car club jackets? Absolutely, I haven't done it. And I went to her embroidery place, which was a little guest house by her house. And there's this bronze plaque sitting there above her sewing machine. I will remember it to this day I die. It says the Gatorettes. I said, what's with that? She goes, my husband was in the Gators. We started an all-female hot rod club called the Gatorettes. I said, you are our permanent embroiderer from this point forward. So just all this stuff just fell in our laps, you know. It's like back in the day in the 50s, they all these different car clubs, they all different coats, you know. So you had to have a car club coat to represent your club. I think the importance of a car club jacket is it identifies who you are, what you represent, your camaraderie, um, the group that you're with. It just, it, it says, you know, we're here. So a lot of things go back to Squeak Bell, right? Like he was sort of our, um, kind of like our dad. You know, he was the, the guy that knew uh, what was going on with hot rods. He was the guy that knew about speed equipment. He knew about engines. He was the guy we talked to. Uh, we had a problem with something yeah. we couldn't figure out. Yeah, and so when we went up there, for the first time in 91, um, he was the one that was telling us about Pastor Robles. Oh, Pastor Robles is coming up. You got to go. You got to go. In the early 90s, if you were into this shit in the early 90s, was Pastor Robles, the West Coast Customs event, the March meets in Bakersfield, the drag races, and the California Hot Rod reunion, which co coincidentally started its first year in 1992. We wanted to go so bad and went to Pastor Robles. We drove this fucking Buick. 53 Buick, all the way up there. Sorry about the cussing. We drove, yeah, we drove this we drove this Buick all the way up there with an emergency brake. All we had was an e-brake because we couldn't find a master cylinder for the car, but we wanted to be there so bad. This is true. And uh, so I gave myself plenty of room to stop, and he never knew it, but I was following him the whole way, and I think if he knew I only had an e-brake, then he probably wouldn't let me follow him. I would have probably been in front. So the meeting point... Every time we went on a rod run, the meeting point was at Anthony's house, Lime Street in Old Town Orange. That was where everybody rendezvoused. Even though we'd plan on leaving at six or seven or eight, it didn't matter. We always left hours later because this one's not, I forgot this, this gal's got to get her makeup back. It's just all this shit happened. The first year we ever went to Paso Robles and on any given day on a properly running machine, it should take about five to six hours to get there. No more than six hours to get there. I remember distinctly, we left at noon 
and we pulled into Spring Street at Paso Robles at exactly midnight. It took us 12 hours because of flat tires, because of oil leaks, because of a wire, just any little thing that could go wrong would go wrong. And it became the joke where people would say, I think we see more of shifters on the side of the freeway than we do at car shows. Paso every year, uh, and quite a few years when I lived in Orange, I lived literally a block from uh, Anthony and maybe two blocks from Kevin. Um, we drove to Paso a couple of years and that, the drive was always the adventure. Always, because we never made it in the allotted time. It was always extra 10 hours, maybe a day, you know, because there's always a bunch of cars that were done the night before that were fresh drives and something always broke, even with me, you know, so yeah. I had my modeler, we all drove up there and Anthony had his coupe and all that. And a little problems broke down a little bit. And it was a long journey, but we made it up there. And it, was, it was a really good time. I was really excited about it. And I just, I thought it was back, you know, to me, it was like back in the 1950s. Because Anthony had his coupe and all that, we're all going up there and had a really good time. And we pull all these hot rods in, and I remember all the people just, what are these cars? They all come running out, checking out all these hot rods and all that. There was really nobody like us. There were some car clubs that had classic cars, some customs, but an all-out, full-blown hot rod club, it just didn't ex It was non-existent in the 90s. Paso was already cool with customs. I mean, but, that's why we were there. But like, dude, we, they, there, there was people there that got it. And there was some people there that didn't get it, but there was a lot of really neat customs there. But what we brought into it was the traditional hot rods. A group, of, a group rod. of guys having these hot rods with multiple carbs, different motors, pulling in, and just everybody just literally is freaked out. And we call it like the, the years of leaning out of the park because yeah. you can see a wave of people just like checking out what the, what the hell's going on here. There was just an ocean of 49 to 51 Mercs in every way, shape, or form that a, you could do a 49 to 51 Merc. We pull in in the east side of the park because that was the only space left. Headers uncorked, making loud noise. We backed in our dear friend, the Royal Jokers, and the, uh, Jose Mejia, Carlos, Hobbs. They're already there in Jose's Model A Coupe. So it looked like he's just part of our pack. We pull in there, and Anthony said that was the year that the park tilted. Like the park tilted, it just came running down to see the cars, you know. It was unreal. I'll never forget that. And shut off, oh, it was just boom, 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 boom. Shutting off. Everyone, when I say everyone, everyone from this park just flooded over. There was probably, Dan, you were there, probably 500 people just surrounding us, including Pac and all. It's like, who are you guys? Where did you come from? This is awesome. It's a, this is the very first shifter's car. Tell us about it. Well, it's the very first shifter's car on the road. Me and Anthony were for building cars. I was building the T, he was building his Model A, Jeff had his Model A, and Alex had a Model A, and also Rob did. So we all had projects. We were, maybe even then, a little bit of a competition. Who can have a car on the road first? And I worked hard on this, and I got it going first. And because it was going first, it really motivated the rest of the guys. They all saw, holy shit, this is possible. But once they saw like me and Anthony rolling up in the same, bop it up, bop it up, bop it up, bop it up, you know, just fully built Cadillac motor, burning out in front of them, all the guys were like, holy shit, I gotta get on my car, we gotta do this. And then all of a sudden it was like this snowball effect, oh shit, Anthony had to get his car going, and then Rob had to get his car going, and it was, it was bitching, because it was just this like energy, like, oh my God, this is happening. We're doing this. And before you knew it, you know, we had like five or six hot rods on the road. 1992, that's when we all busted out the shifters with these hot rods. We really didn't care that much about what our other people thought. It was about impressing each other. You know, we called it a, we called it the bust out. My brother busted out with the purple pea bleeder. Anthony busted out with what was referred to as the brown neck bandito a very Ed Roth influenced bubble top, but done with his flavor again. Yeah, you know, we wouldn't tell. It would be two guys working on something over here, two guys working over there in another city. Cause you know, we're, you know, Southern California is pretty big. Uh, me and Anthony tried to, cause we actually built our cars together in the shop. And um, you know, after hours of working on the customer's cars and then, you know, working on cars, I actually kind of got mine somewhat together and uh, running actually fired up no throttle and like that and it's like we're gonna go paso anthony tried to get his car 
and the bubble top. Yeah, it just couldn't pull it off. So that's right. I remember, like, the, I remember the I remember the the people leader was there first, and yeah. the bubble top was next year. So it was actually a Saturday at the time. I actually get up there, and it was already in the afternoon, and I pulled up on the trailer still, and people just blown away, like what the hell? Yeah. And I tried to get up there just for our show so that we. What we year do. was that? Two thousand. That was um two thousand. Yeah, I remember him pulling up. It was still in gray primer, and it was hot that year. And he had his shirt off, you know, like, eh, whatever. I'm so groundy. Like, I just loaded the train and, and just left. I didn't even shower, nothing. I was just like, let's come out on the road. So by by that time, by 2000, there was already all these hot rod clubs and stuff. I, I you know, there was a lot of things going on. There was there was the Deacons and there was the Choppers and there was everybody else. He pulled up in that thing. It was still on the trailer and just pulled up. And said, oh, there it is. Everybody was just like, what the hell? <laughs> this is some next level shit. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it was, was just cool. like, it was... It's like everybody's trying to do what we're doing or try to do what we're doing, but we're always like always the next level of things. Yeah. When the shifters started building the hot rods that would change the world for generations, they put all those cars on coker tires. Now, 30 years ago, running a bias ply white wall on a rowdy hot rod like this one wasn't just a tire choice, but a real statement about the heart and soul of its owner. And the same holds true today. The right tire on your car is as much about you as it is about the car. The shifters made the park tilt on Coker tires, and it's almost poetic that Coker got behind this documentary project. So make sure you subscribe, catch every episode of this limited series from the Motor Underground, and then go change the world on your new Cokers. I mean, who knows, maybe someday we'll be telling your story.